The failing New York Times has platformed Gaylor, a noted conspiracy theory that insists Taylor Swift uses her music to imply that she is a lesbian, or at the very least queer, throughout her work. There are varying degrees of Gaylorism, but it all comes back to the same thing, a fundamental distrust of the narrative Taylor Swift herself has been telling for years throughout her life's work. Every single thing she does is picked apart and used as evidence to support a completely unsubstantiated claim. Real evidence such as the many times where Taylor has gone on the record and deliberately stated that she is not part of the LGBTQIA community, is completely ignored or incredibly twisted to be further used as proof of the conspiracy. It is very, very important that we only refer to Gaylorism as a conspiracy theory. There is no merit or factual basis to this meth math, and legitimizing it by platforming it in the New York Times is mind-bogglingly idiotic behavior. Because it's an op-ed, I suppose you can make the argument that all the right had to do was convincingly make an argument, but this is a load of hogwash. This is a word salad, which has one goal, to convince the reader that Taylor Swift is a secret gay. I thought that we as a culture, and especially we at the Wokeified New York Times, agreed years ago, collectively, that outing people was a bad thing, or even that speculating publicly on other people's sexual orientation was in fact crossing a line, but apparently not when it comes to Taylor Swift. You see, the most maleficent thing about Gaylers is the second you try to refute their claims, or take it back to a place of reality, they invoke the homophobia card. And I'm sure that the failing New York Times is actually too scared to push back on things like this in fear of receiving such an allegation. They also want clicks, so there's that too. If the New York Times seeks to platform conspiracy theories, why are they so hasty to denounce, I don't know, having op-eds from people like Alex Jones or one of the QAnon numbskulls who insurrected the Capitol? You may clutch your pearls and say, how dare you compare those heathens to Gaylers? But the way in which Gaylers draw their their conclusions and spread their message is no better and no different than any far-right conspiracy theorist, the ones that you, the New York Times, and other people love to deride and promote as dangerous. This writer, Anna Marks, has written an astonishingly convoluted, poorly written, and confusing article that seeks to say one thing and one thing only. Taylor Swift is gay and she won't tell us that, but we know it anyway. There are many diatribes and detours that Anna Marks makes in order to convince us that she is trying to say something that actually has some sort of worthy justification or substance, but she fails at every turn to turn her good points, for example, that queer artists suffer reputational damage for coming out in the music industry, into supporting evidence for her crackhead theory. Interesting that her only other opinion column for the New York Times was also about Harry Styles being covertly gay. You seem to be very interested in other people's sexualities, Ms. Marks. What I loathe the most about this piece is that she speaks with such authority on behalf of the queer Swifties, as though we all automatically agree with this insane interpretation of Taylor Swift's work. Make no mistake, we don't. Gaylorism is a fringe, increasingly more mainstream conspiracy theory. Most normal Swifties still, however, gay, straight, and however else they identify, don't engage with this nonsense on a serious basis. At the end of the day, this writer is a Gaylor masquerading as a journalist exploring the topic of Gaylorism. There could be an interesting article about the ways in which this conspiracy theory has taken hold of a certain subsect of the fandom, but instead we got the Taylor Swift is gay and I'm going to write about it as though I don't really believe that, when actually that was the animating impulse behind writing this in the first place. So for context, I'm a journalist and in this video I'm going to be deconstructing why I think this article is complete and total nonsense and why it's a conspiracy theory and how you can tell when someone is peddling a conspiracy theory right in your face. It's become a lot more confusing with the advent of social media and the overwhelm of the information age. Age, but there is still specific and defining characteristics of conspiracy theories and cult-like behavior that are easy to identify if you look hard enough. One would think that the editors at the New York Times would be able to detect them. If you're new here, my name is Zach. I'm the Swiftologist. I make thoughtful weekly videos about pop culture. This month is Grammy month. I am talking about all the albums that are up for album of the year, the ones that I really think deserve to win, starting with Guts by Olivia Rodrigo on Sunday, but I had to make an emergency video, first emergency video of 2024. And this is a subject that I really have not addressed much in the past because I really don't like giving conspiracy theories any air. I don't like validating them or legitimizing them, but I feel like as of late, there's been a lot of mainstream discourse around Gaylorism and not a lot of pushback. So I wish to be the opposing force. And I do believe that any healthy media environment has equal and opposite reactions. So this is my response to the insane Gaylor op-ed article in the New York Times. Make sure to check out my podcast, Evolution of a Snake, for more constructive, critical, analytical conversations about Taylor Swift that are based in facts.
make sure to check that out. Let's start with why conspiracy theories are bad. They are based on misinformation and false beliefs, which multiply and spread. This may seem harmless when it comes to Gaylorism, but take the way that Gaylor has infiltrated mainstream discourse and apply it to, I don't know, vaccine disinformation, and you will not see a New York Times op-ed sanctioned article discussing the benefits of not taking a vaccine. Conspiracy theories erode trust in institutions, authorities, and experts, and the expert we're refusing to trust here is Taylor Swift. Conspiracy theories rarely solve the problems they present, but they only exasperate them by insisting based on misinformation and false beliefs that Taylor is a closeted queer person, you are messaging to other people that one, your sexuality is knowable to people other than you, even when you're not ready to talk about it, or you've told them something different. And that two, no matter how hard you try to hide something, it is okay and morally justified for someone else to expose whatever that hidden secret is in the name of making other queer people feel valid. You're going to see there are many logical knots that the Gaylers tie themselves in. And I just want to also be clear at the top of this video that this is not for the Gaylers. I'm not trying to convince you you can do your math math and cook in the lab, whatever you want. I also do not take any of your critiques of me seriously, because why am I going to listen to a conspiracy theorist? I know that I will be called homophobic and whatever it else it is they want to say, but you know, I'm also speaking from this with my lived experience of being a gay male in a, some might say, fairly authoritarian country that has only recently decriminalized homosexual sex. So I have my own experience with, uh, let's say, people identifying me as being gay and talking about it before I was ready for it to be talked about that definitely informs the way I'm approaching this video. So this inordinate focus on trying to force Taylor to come out or to out her to other people and get them involved in the Gaylor conspiracy takes attention away from actual queer artists who openly write about their queer experiences. Where's the support for Chapel Rowan from these Gaylers? Why must it only be that Taylor Swift is the queen of sapphic lyricism? Conspiracy theories also lead to radicalization, which is harmful. Here's a non-exhaustive list of things that Gaylers have done in order to defend their false beliefs. Attacked Maya Thompson, the mother of a dead child, Ronan, who Taylor wrote a song about and celebrated his death. Spread rumors that a lyric, lock broken, slur spoken, was proof that Scott Swift broke into Taylor Swift's diary, read that she was gay and called her a slur. Dogpiling on Taylor Swift whenever she suggests or vaguely alludes to being uncomfortable when people spread rumors about her, such as when she announced the meaning of Lavender Haze, which went against the made-up story. Gaylers have created in their head. Again, the creator of the work is telling you what she means and you are refusing to believe it. That is a false belief. They said that she was fingering the air while performing Marjorie, a song about her dead grandmother. And they also started domestic abuse rumors about her relationship with Joe Alwyn in 2020. They've accused her father, Scott Swift, of essaying her and argued that Taylor should be placed under a conservatorship. The list goes on and on and on. So why in the world, New York Times, are you platforming this? This is where it leads to. The issue with this specific article is not even they wrote about Gaylorism. It's that it was written by a conspiracy theorist and is peddling lies and false information as though it is fact. This is how conspiracy theories spread. I'll be pointing out how the author engages in these behaviors as I go through the article. Pattern recognition. Humans have a tendency to see patterns in random information. This is known as apophenia or pareidolia. I don't think I'm pronouncing that right. But this leads to finding connections where none exist. Another example of false pattern identifiers are the 9-11 truther movement, which suggests that there was intricate patterns and plots behind the attacks and also interpret anomalies in the events as evidence of a larger conspiracy. I will expand on pattern recognition at great length throughout this video. We also have confirmation bias, and this is where people tend to favor information that confirms their pre-existing beliefs or hypotheses. The article written by Anna Marks literally describes her descent into confirmation bias with a lack of self-awareness that is truly astounding. Then we also have proportionality bias. There's a tendency to believe that big events must have big causes, leading people to dismiss simpler explanation. The assassination of JFK created numerous conspiracy theories as people really struggle to accept that a lone gunman could significantly alter the course of history. Anna Marks links Taylor's artistic decisions to broader societal issues and themes, such as compulsory heterosexuality. These themes are patently unpresent in the text. Anna suggests that Swift's work is, in fact, a complex commentary on these issues, rather than just an individual artistic expression. This is because she believes there is a bigger point that she's, you know, insistent upon uncovering. So the confirmation bias comes in there, too. Social media platforms also have a huge role to play in the spread of misinformation as well. The New York Times has written extensively about this, so it's confusing as to why they are platforming this nonsense to begin with. We have algorithmic bias on platforms like YouTube. Algorithms will sometimes promote conspiracy theory content by recommending it to users who have viewed similar videos. Then we also have information overload, and this is especially applicable to TikTok, which is where a lot of the Gaylorism starts. The abundance of information online makes it challenging to discern the truth. We see this with various conspiracy theories across different internet platforms, but very predominantly on short form video. And conspiracy theories are presented convincingly. And due to our natural predisposition as human beings towards things like false pattern recognition, that's why they can feel really true. Now we're gonna go into a line by line of the nonsense. Bear with me, I'm feeling a little crabby 
because this article has really irritated me. It's very long, so I'll try to be concise where I can. But the article opens with an anecdote that compares Taylor to an artist that K-worded herself because when she came out, she failed to find continued success as a gay female performer in the country music space. So we start with making a false equivalency. In 2006, the year Taylor Swift released her first single, a closeted country singer named Shelly Wright held a 9 millimeter pistol in her mouth. With the suicide of a widely unknown female country singer, probably especially to Taylor Swift, is a deceptive link between Taylor's career as a country singer, deliberately in tandem with closeted queerness, which is something that you'll see a lot of throughout this article. False equivalencies are this girly's bread and butter. Anna then goes on to talk about the culture in which this event occurred. And she says, I want to make it very clear, she says, it's dizzying to think about the strides that have been made in Americans' acceptance of the LGBT community over the past decade. Marriage equality, queer themes dominating teen entertainment, anti-discrimination laws and housing for now in the workplace, but in recent years, a steady drip of stars have disclosed that they had felt encouraged to suppress their queerness in order to market projects or remain bankable. So then she says, the culture of country music hasn't changed so much that homophobia is gone. This isn't really relevant to Taylor Swift, as she hasn't worked with the country music industry professionals in a major capacity since 2013. Country music is really becoming a straw man argument or a stand in for the repressive patriarchal heteronormative society here, because she poses this question at the end of this paragraph saying, if country music hasn't changed enough, what's to stay the larger entertainment industry and by extension, our broader culture has? This is another false equivalency. If the most conservative facet of the industry, as you just acknowledged, hasn't changed that much, then surely the rest of it is still deeply repressive. You can try and make this argument, but in the same breath in the paragraph above, the writer is acknowledging the dizzying strides that have been made for the LGBT community and has also acknowledged that queer themes are very profitable and dominate entertainment at large right now. So, so why are we setting up the conspiracy here? This is just confusing. It's confusing until we reach this segue. The writer is referring to a video of this country singer answering questions at a Borders bookstore signing. It's going to keep going, Miss Wright says, until someone who has something to lose stands up and just says, I'm gay. Somebody big, she continues. We need our heroes. Of course, the writer then profoundly posits, what if someone had already tried at least once to change the culture by becoming such a hero? And what if, because our culture had yet to come to terms with the homophobia, it wasn't ready for her? And what if that hero's name was Taylor Allison Swift? This is ridiculous. It's truly wild and completely unsubstantiated. What does this woman signing at a Borders bookstore have to do with Taylor's long history of being closeted? And how can the current culture not be ready for her when the New York Times is happily and gladly publishing op-eds about how she's hopefully gay? You've acknowledged that queer themes dominate popular culture, so how can you in the same breath be saying that it is so taboo for her to come out as being gay, really not that taboo in liberal popular culture at the moment, that she is deeply, deeply repressed and has tried to save us from homophobia, but can't because it's too scary. So then she goes into most of the Gaylor's entry points, which is the lover era. In the world of Taylor Swift, the start of a new era means the release of new art. So she's talking about all the lore that gets developed, all the different kinds of, what does she call it? Paratexts that get associated with a new production. In 2019, she was set to release a new album, Lover, the first since she left Big Machine Records, her old Nashville-based label, which she has since said limited her creative freedom. The aesthetic of what would be known as the lover era emerged as rainbows, butterflies, and pastel shades of blue, purple, and pink, colors that subtly evoke the bisexual pride flag. Confirmation bias here. Because she used the colors of the bisexual pride flag, that must mean that she is bisexual and trying to tell me so. On April 26th, Lesbian Visibility Day, Miss Swift released the album's lead single, Me, noted amazing song, in which she sings about self-love and self-acceptance. <laughs> She co-directed a campy music video to accompany it, which she would later describe as depicting everything that makes me me. It features Miss Swift dancing at a pride parade, dripping in rainbow paint, and turning down a man's marriage proposal in exchange for a pussy cat. What you're seeing here is non-causal pattern recognition. We talked about this earlier. This is something the conspiracy theorists love to do. There is no direct causation between the event of directing a campy music video and receiving a cat that is meant to imply that you like pussy. There isn't. You made that up. At the end of June, the LGBT community would celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. On June 14th, Miss Swift released the video for her attempt at a pride anthem. Attempt. You need to calm down in which she and an army of queer celebrities from across generations, the Queer Eye host, Ellen, Billy Porter, Haley Kiyoko, to name a few, resist homophobia by living openly. Miss Swift sings that outrage against queer visibility is a waste of time and energy. Why are you mad when you could be glad? And it was said as only a performative ally could. You need to calm down is really the only anti-Gaylor proof we've ever needed. That could only have been created by a straight person. The video ends with a plea. Let's show our pride by demanding that on a national level, our laws truly treat all our citizens equally. Many in the press and otherwise <laughs> saw the video as, at best, a misguided attempt at allyship, and at worst, a straight woman co-opting queer aesthetics and narratives to promote a commercial product. 
And they were right. And there is, in fact, more historical context to support this supposition that she was being a performative ally than there is to support what you are going to present as the alternative supposition. Post-reputation, Taylor received a huge amount of flack for remaining apolitical. Her stance on social issues was not clear at a time when liberal ideology was more important to virtue signal towards than ever in the vicious anti-Trump era. In an increasingly polarized environment, she took legal action against those that were calling her an Aryan princess. She felt very stifled politically and repressed by her team from speaking out about her political beliefs. And she had just come out as a Democrat and was swiftly told that doing that alone was not enough. Her image rehabilitation also hadn't worked as well as she thought it had. Reputation did not perform to the same standard as her prior records. And its critical reception, which is very important to Taylor as an artist, was lukewarm at best. Taylor being the savvy person that she is, knew she had to get with the times and start signaling that she actually gave a damn about what was going on in her country. And the way that she went about doing this was, as most pop star activism is, extremely corny and over the top. The portrayal of queerness in You Need to Calm Down is so deeply stereotypical that it is almost offensive. And any gay person who is clued into the inner workings of what goes on in the queer community would not make You Need to Calm Down. No one really saw that as a display of allyship other than simpletons. It was truly viewed as an opportunistic moment and a very, very deeply cynical thing for her to do. Then Miss Swift performed Shake It Off as a surprise for patrons at the Stonewall in rumors that were perhaps little more than fantasies. Again, with the perhaps, just come out and say what you mean. You believe this stuff, so believe it. Don't say that you think they could be fantasies. We all know you think this is true. Swirled in the queerer corners of her fandom, not my queerer corners. This is something that really gets me going about this article and Gaylers in general, is that they proclaim to speak on behalf of all queer fans. And as a gay man, do not include me in that. Talk about yourselves. Talk about the gaylers. Refer to yourselves as what you are, gaylers, conspiracy theorists. Don't refer to the proverbial queer community to defend your Looney Tunes. Stoked by a suggestive post by the fashion designer Christian Siriano, would Miss Swift attend New York City's World Pride March on June 30th? Would she wear a dress spun from a rainbow? Would she give a speech? If she did, what would she declare about herself? It's actually so delusional to me that people think that this is true. <laughs> It's funny. It's funny. It's really funny. The Sunday of the march, those fantasies stopped. She announced that the music executive Scooter Braun, who she described as an incessant manipulative bully, purchased her masters, the lucrative original recordings of her work. So here we can see some proportionality bias. The idea of a woman who was so directly in control of her public image and her handcrafted career, widely known as a calculating snake, the idea of her losing control of her work was so difficult to understand that actually many conspiracy theories were spawned in response to explain how this happened. There was the theory that her dad was secretly in on it, that something went down between Selena Gomez and Justin Bieber, and that was the kind of founding beef between Scooter Braun and Taylor, that Taylor had refused to perform at Scooter Braun's events, Carly was feeding Scooter information, and this new one, that she's secretly gay, so losing her masters was deeply liberating for her instead of a gigantic and inexplicable loss of control. Miss Swift's Lover was the first record that she created with nearly unchecked creative of freedom. And how did that go? Lacking her old label's constraints, she specifically chose to feature activism for and the aesthetics of the LGBT community in her confessional self-expressive art. So here the writer is making a false equivalence between Taylor's confessional art and the non-confessional activist songs on Lover. The activist aesthetics really did not pan to the entire album. They were extended to one song, You Need to Calm Down, though you might like to meth head yourself into believing otherwise. The other activism songs, Miss Americana and Only the Young, are also very patently not about her. She made it very clear that these activism songs were about her trying to be a good ally and to show up for communities that she wasn't a part of. But again, that's not confirmatory information, so the Gaylers dismiss it, of course. This is addressed in this article. Even before the sale of her masters, she appeared to be stepping into a new identity, not just an aesthetic that was distinct from that associated with her past six albums. Have we considered that perhaps this was because she was coming off of being canceled? This is a canonical event that she has repeatedly said changed the course of her relationship with the public eye forever, specifically. So that new identity was not certainly her new sexuality. What would lead you to believe that. And anyway, if you think, as you said throughout this article, Ms. Anna, that this has been her identity all along, as you have argued, why would she only just step into it now? Did she just wake up and become gay? Or did she wake up gay when she released her first single in 2006 to fight compulsory heterosexuality? Hmm? When looking back... <laughs> This part is really crazy. When looking back on the artifacts of the months before the album release, any close reader of Miss Swift's has a choice. We can consider the album's aesthetics and activism as performative allyship, as they were largely considered to be at the time, or we can ask a question, knowing full well that we may never learn the answer. What if the Lover era was merely Miss Swift's attempt to douse her work and herself in rainbows, as so many baby queers feel compelled to do as they come out to the world? 
First of all, again, don't speak on behalf of baby queers and queer people as if we are some monolith, as if we are some group of people that is easily explained and easily spoken for by just one experience. That was not how I felt when I came out. I was deeply uncomfortable with myself and certainly was not rushing to surround myself with rainbows. And for someone who is incredibly pained and tortured, as you suggest Taylor Swift is, for being trapped in the closet all her career long, why, why would she come out in such a dramatic and celebratory fashion? But either way, we don't need to talk about that because that's not the reality of what happened. What the hell is this false binary? This is an erroneous premise that limits what options are available. Why are there only two choices to make here? And why do we have to make this choice to begin with at all? It can only be performative allyship or she's a gay woman. No other explanation for the lover era will be taken into consideration. Not what she talked about in Miss Americana, her fears of aging out, chasing relevance, living up to the new contract with Universal Music Group and proving her old enemies wrong, pivoting from the dark-sided associations of snake gate on reputation, being in love with her man. Why are all of those options suddenly off the table? It's because you want the reader to pick one choice knowing full well we may never learn the answer, because deep down you know this is nonsense. There's no way of knowing what happened if Miss Swift's masters hadn't been sold, implying that Big Machine was somehow withholding her from coming out or speaking her truth. If that's the truth and she's free now, why hasn't she come out? And if it was so constrained in the first place, why was she, according to you, able to signal to the public from such a young age in the thick of this deal that she was queer? It's not adding up. All we know is what happened next. In early August, Miss Swift posted a rainbow glazed photo of a series of friendship bracelets, one of which says proud with beads in the color of the bisexual pride flag. I can't believe this was written in the New York Times. It shocks me. Queer people recognized that this word, again, stop speaking for me, deployed this way typically means that someone is proud of his or her own identity. But the public did not widely view this as Miss Swift's coming out. Again, this is false pattern recognition to say that the only thing that you mean when you're saying that you're proud is that you're proud of being gay is just not reality. Then Vogue released an interview with Taylor Swift that was conducted in early June. When discussing her motivations for releasing You Need to Calm Down, Swift said, rights are being stripped from basically everyone who isn't a straight white cisgender male. She continued, I didn't realize until recently that I could advocate for a community that I'm not part of. That statement suggests that Miss Swift did not in early June consider herself part of the community. It does not illuminate whether that is because she was a straight cis ally or because she was stuck in the shadowy solitary recesses of the closet. What happened to giving people the right to self identify? Who are you to suggest that she was stuck in a shadowy closet? And why are you so allergic to taking the words from the horse's mouth? Because you claim to come from a place of admiration and deep respect towards Taylor with a trust in her work and a belief in the profundity of it towards queer people. Yet you completely deny the creator of this work, who you believe to be a queer person, her own agency and right to claim it, speak about it, or identify her position within it. Only you and your conspirators can decide whether or not she is being truthful and whether or not she means what she says. Does that sound like someone who deeply respects the work or is invested in the canon or has been closely reading the career for a long period of time? No, it sounds like a delusional 9-11 truther which is what this is. On August 22nd, Miss Swift publicly committed herself to the as of then unproven project of recording and re-releasing her first six albums. The next day, she finally released Lover, which raises more questions than it answers to you, not to normal people. Why does she have to keep secrets just to keep her muse as all her fans still sing scream on Cruel Summer? About what are the hundred thrown out speeches I almost said to you in her chronicle of self-doubt, The Archer, if not her identity? And what could the album's closing words, which come at the conclusion of Daylight, a song about stepping out of a 20-year darkness and choosing to let it go, possibly signal? First of all, Daylight is a horrible example of Gaylor Proof. That's one of the worst ones I've seen so far because those lyrics are so intentionally bland and vague that they could be anything. So sure, they could be about, they could be about being a furry. This is Taylor coming out as a furry. In regards to Cruel Summer, maybe because she was cheating on her boyfriend, as was documented at length actually on Midnight's and Reputation, Getaway Car, heard of it? Or it could be about hiding from the paparazzi who ruthlessly document every move she makes and who she was notably trying to hide from. Nobody physically saw me for a year. Have you heard of that? There are much more reasonable and plausible ways to ascertain entertain what these songs are about that are actually based in fact, still speculative, but rooted in reality. Instead, Gaylers always want to take it to a place of unsubstantiated. Is when proof of the conspiracy supposedly emerges from a pattern of connecting the dots between events that need not be causally connected, when no evidence supports these connections except the allegation of the conspiracy, because that's the only thing that strings together the assertion that those three songs are about her being gay, or when the evidence fits equally well to other causal connections, like she's a furry, or to randomness, <laughs> also easy to prove the conspiracy is likely to be false. And here we arrive at the first completely delusional moment exhibited by Anna Marks here. The first time I viewed Lover through the prism of queerness, I felt delirious. 
almost insane. <laughs> you are so close, queen. You're so close to it. I kept wondering whether what I was perceiving in her work was truly there or if it was merely a mirage born out of earnest projection. I have something to tell you. I have something to tell you. It's all a mirage. <laughs> it's all a dream. And you can wake up now because this is getting out of hand. This is when the real conspiracy theory rhetoric starts to begin. And returning to that checklist, a conspiracy theorist refuses to consider alternate explanations, rejecting all disconfirming evidence, and blatantly seeking out only confirmatory evidence to support what he or she has prior determined to be the truth. And that is something that this writer has done before they even sat down to write this article was decide that Taylor Swift is in fact hiding her sexuality from the public and she has a vested interest in doing so. They have decided that and the whole article flows from that. My longtime reading of Miss Swift's celebrity, like that of a majority of her fan base, again, I loathe to be spoken for by this absolute numbskull. My reading of her celebrity is based on the culmination of years of context, clues, information, and the way she describes herself and her work. I respect her as a person and an artist, and so I take her word at face value 99% of the time. Any speculation that I do, I make very clear to say that it is, in fact, just conjecture. I never try and browbeat people into thinking that my version of the truth is the one and only absolute truth. That is a key difference between a conspiracy theorist and a normal person. I am willing to accept alternate explanations for things. I will listen and hear you out on your theory. I will not double down and insist on something that I don't know for a hundred percent to be true. And I am also willing to change my mind. This passage of the article is actually very sloppily written because it begins with my longtime reading of Miss Swift's celebrity is what everyone else is or what she perceives everyone else's reading of it to be. And she spends this entire paragraph just describing what that is and there's no logical knot to the end of it. The thread of how her perception of Taylor Swift's work actually changed only comes back to us I think maybe like six paragraphs down. It's very confusing what she's actually trying to say here. So she then goes to start talking about what Taylor's relationship was with the media in the late 2000s and she's talking about the way that Taylor started Easter egging and doing lore etc cetera, etc. Cetera. When she was trying to sell her albums in that late 2000s media environment her songwriting didn't match the image of a sex object the usual role reserved for female celebrities in our culture. Instead the story the public told about her was that she laundered her affection to a litter of promising grown men in exchange for songwriting inspiration. A young Swift contributed to this narrative by hiding easy to decode clues in her liner notes. Despite the expansive storytelling in Miss Swift's early records, her public image often cast a man's interest as her greatest ambition. Yes, and now with this article, what you're doing is exactly the same thing, making her shadowy closeted life and the coded messaging of her queerness her greatest ambition and ignoring the expansive storytelling in the most extreme manner. As Miss Swift's career progressed, she began to remake that image, changing her style and presentation, leaving country music for pop and moving from Nashville to New York. By 2019, her celebrity no longer reflected traditional culture. It had instead become a girl bossy mirror for another dominant culture, that of white cosmopolitan neoliberal America. What are you talking about, babes? Literally, what are you saying? These are the incoherent ramblings of a crazy person. You started this diatribe out with being like, my longtime reading of Miss Swift's celebrity used to be this, and we ended with, she is a girl bossy mirror for white cosmopolitan neoliberal America. I don't disagree with that last characterization, but how did you arrive at that conclusion? It's not making sense to me. Whoever edited this... I think she edited it herself because she's an editor at the New York Times. I really wish someone had given this a second glance over before it went to press. But in every incarnation, the public has largely seen those songs, especially those for which she doesn't directly state her inspiration as cantos about her recent heterosexual love, whether that idea is substantiated by evidence or not. It is very rich for a gayler to critique literally anyone in the world for behaving as though their ideas are substantiated by evidence when in fact they are not. Point me to one piece of solid evidence that is presented in this entire article, this nine million trillion word article. Show me one solid piece of evidence of what this writer is actually trying to say. You can't because it doesn't exist and also because there's no point being made here. You will find that the logic of this article is non-existent. I was going to say it falls apart, but it never appeared to begin with. So it can't fall apart if it didn't exist. Then the writer kind of looks down on the feverish discussions of her escapades with the latest yassified London boy or mustachioed Mr. Americana that fuels the tabloid press and embarrassingly much of traditional media that courts fan engagement by relentlessly, unquestioningly chronicling Miss Swift's love life. And you do this too, except you make it up in your head. You're no better, smarter, or wiser than the rest of us. I hate the smugness of the gailers. You're not in on some big secret. You're delusional 9-11 truthers. Where 
Where were you on January 6th? That's what we need to know. That's what the next op-ed should be about. Public discussion about the romantic entanglements of Miss Swift presumes that the right man will finally mean the end of her persistent husbandlessness and childlessness. I hate that they're actually trying to use a useful critique of our culture, the inordinate focus on Taylor's commitment or lack thereof to traditional gender roles with Gaylorism. It invalidates the criticism by taking it to a further place of invasion and crazy. Because Miss Swift has an undeniably subverted our culture's traditional expectations, she has managed in an increasingly fractured cultural environment to simultaneously capture two dominant cultures, traditional and cosmopolitan. This is the only good point and interesting point that's been made throughout this article. Sadly, it's presented alongside the Zodiac Killer's chicken scratches. To maintain the stranglehold she has on pop culture, Miss Swift must continue to tell a story that those audiences expect to consume. She falls in love with a man or gets revenge. As a result, her confessional songs languish in a place of presumed stasis, even as their meaning has grown deeper and their craft more intricate, a substantial portion of her audience's understanding of them remains wedded to the same old narratives. This is very confusing to me, and again, veering straight into conspiracy theory territory, where there's a real truth that only you know, and you are totally not open to any other interpretation. Why do you presume Why do you presume to know the real and true narratives? This is the difference between a skeptic or a critic and a conspiracy theory. I will concede that I don't really know who many of these songs are about, and I will even concede that some of them could be about women. Yes, they could. Shock horror. I will never insist that I know for 100% sure, without a doubt, who or what a song is about. Gaylers, however insist otherwise and that's how you know that they're coming from a place of delusion this is a hallmark of a conspiracy theorist to deny alternative explanations in favor of confirmatory evidence that agrees with your predetermined truth you're not hearing these songs in a more advanced way you're just speaking into another echo chamber but if interpretations of miss swift's art often languish in stasis so do the millions upon millions of people who love to play with the dollhouse she has constructed for them her dominance in pop culture and the success of her business have given her the rare ability to influence not only her industry but also the worldview of a substantial portion of America. How might her industry, our culture, and we ourselves change if we made space for Swift to burn that dollhouse to the ground? Again, what you're really missing here is her agency. What if Taylor Swift is not interested in burning this fictitious, oppressive dollhouse that you're speaking of to the ground? It works very well for her and continues to do so. She is clearly happier than she's ever been, according to the Time Magazine profile, which I'm sure you have some delusional rebuttal against, with this burdensome dollhouse in the foreground nonetheless. Perhaps she doesn't want you to make space for her to burn it down. I think Gaylers truly long for Taylor to just be in some sort of abject, secret, silent misery all the time, because the last last thing they want is for her to actually be happy and to express a sincere happiness. What they really want is for her to suffer in silence and to keep sending them coded secret satanic messages. Anyone considering the whole of Miss Swift's artistry, the way that her brilliantly calculated celebrity mixes with her soul-bearing art, can find discrepancies between the story that underpins her celebrity and the one captured by her songs. This is absolutely true, and it's true for any artist that writes about themselves, from a memoirist to a songwriter, as a protagonist narrator, and also the editing hand of God, you are the judge and the jury of your subjective experience. There is, of course room for interpretation from the audience but the final word on what your work is about belongs to the artist Gaylers don't want to understand that. It belongs to them, in their opinion. One such gap can be found in her lover era. You have not provided enough evidence for what this gap is or how it proves that she's gay, beyond quoting three lyrics from Cruel Summer, The Archer, and Daylight. Others appear alongside dropped hairpins or the covert ways someone can signal queer identity to those in the know while leaving others comfortable in their ignorance. Miss Swift dropped hairpins before Lover and has continued to do so since. Again, this is where the plot really starts to unravel. Compiling facts and speculations without trying to discern between the two or make it clear when you are in fact speculating is a dishonest way to approach delivering information to people, even when you're writing an op-ed. It's true that there are gaps in her stories. You have not, however, proven factually that those gaps are the covert smoking gun queer hairpins that you've just mentioned. Just because you say those two things in conjunction with each other doesn't make the connection that you've made true. Sometimes Miss Swift communicates through explicit sartorial choices. Hair the colors of the bisexual flag or a recurring motif of rainbow dresses. She frequently depicts herself as trapped in glass closets or in regular closets. She drops hairpins on tour as well. False pattern recognition. I can't even bother to refute these because they are so deeply asinine and stereotypical. When you come to a predetermined outcome, suddenly everything starts to look like evidence and proof. Dropped hairpins also appear in Miss Swift's songwriting. Sometimes the description of a muse, the subject of her song or to whom she sings, seems only to fit a woman as it does in It's Nice to Have a Friend, Maroon, or Hits Different. Sometimes she suggests a female muse through unfulfilled rhyme schemes as she does in the very first night. When she's sings didn't read the note on the Polaroid picture they don't know how much I miss you instead of her instead of that pesky little you would rhyme her songwriting also noticeably alludes to poets who uses the historical record incorrectly cast as men Emily Dickinson chief amongst them as if to suggest the same fate awaits her stunningly she even refers to dropping hairpins not once but twice on two separate albums again 
that false pattern recognition where there's no evidence that supports the connection between these events except for the allegation of the conspiracy. This kind of analysis that the writer is attempting to give here really relies heavily on subjective interpretation and the connecting of events or details that may not be directly related to convey their personal message. The writer does not acknowledge that this is a subjective interpretation and amidst key contextual facts about what's being presented to make her point, Emily Dickinson is a massively influential writer to many young women and men, gay, straight, and whatever around the world and has been throughout history. Referencing her is not an Easter egg to say that you're going to live your entire life in the closet and that your life's work will only be viewed correctly in your death. That's a crazy assertion to make, especially when the Emily Dickinson Taylor Swift comparisons are not even that clear to begin with. The Very First Night is a song also that is written entirely in second person. It's all addressed to the proverbial you. It would make no sense narratively or grammatically to randomly have replaced you with her, even though it rhymes. In isolation, a single dropped hairpin is perhaps meaningless or accidental, but considered together by you, they're the unfurling of a ballerina bun after a long performance. Again, false pattern identification. You have assigned significance and meaning to a smaller insignificant event that can be described as non-causal or coincidence, and instead you have assigned your own subjective meaning to it in order to create a pattern. Those dropped hairpins began to appear in Miss Swift's artistry long before queer identity was undeniably marketable to mainstream America, but wasn't she so oppressed that she couldn't do anything about it? I thought that was the case, was it not? They suggest to queer people that she is one of us. They also suggest that her art may be far more complex than the eclipsing nature of her celebrity may allow even now. No, they don't. They actually don't suggest that. I'm a gay person and that actually is not suggested to me at all. It is suggested to the gaylers and to conspiracy theorists. It is not suggested to gay people at large. Anyone who claims to be able to speak on behalf of an entire group of people is arrogant at best and ignorant at worst. Since at least her lover era, Miss Swift has explicitly encouraged fans to read into the coded messages she leaves in music videos, social media posts, and interviews with traditional media outlets. But a majority of those fans largely ignore or discount the dropped hairpins that might hint at queer identity. Again, you have to keep saying might seem perhaps because you cannot solidify these claims with any factual evidence. If you could, you wouldn't need to be hedging your bets all the time. For them, acknowledging even the possibility that Miss Swift could be queer would irrevocably alter the way they connect with her celebrity. The true products they're consuming. This is really offensive. And again, Gaylers are always getting on their insane high horse when they are really the ones who are obsessed with viewing Taylor Swift as a product or a riddle to solve. She is never to be taken seriously or at face value. Her life stories are to be dissected and bent out of shape. Her own meaning doesn't matter as much as your feelings being validated, which supersedes any sort of polite societal norms. It's upsetting to continuously speculate about someone's sexuality in public. It's uncomfortable, it's invasive, and it can have dire outcomes when it's done to not Taylor Swift or famous people in general. I know this firsthand from experiencing this from when I wasn't ready to speak about my sexuality and people speculated on it for me in public. Some people even tried to do it in a kind way to try and force me to come out. And instead that made me feel more isolated, more alone and more terrified. So what this really does is encourage a very negative kind of speculation and a very superficial engagement with what it means to be queer. And I think that it disrupts the reality of what it's like to actually be a gay person. And that's what gets people going, normal people going about gayler. Not that we refuse used to see the truth, which is what any conspiracist is always going to say. There is such public devotion to the traditional narrative Miss Swift embodies because American culture enshrines male power. In her sweeping essay, Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence, the lesbian feminist poet Adrian Rich identifies the way that male power cramps, hinders, or devalues women's creativity. All of the sexist undertones with which Miss Swift's work can be discussed, often even by fans, flow from compulsory heterosexuality or the way patriarchy draws power from the presumption that women naturally desire men. She must write about men she surely loves or be unbankable. She must marry and bear children or remain a child herself. She must look like, in her words, a sexy baby or be undesirable. So here the writer is literally bastardizing another writer's work in order to preemptively combat a valid critique that is going to come up of this article with their own ideas that cannot be substantiated. Anyone who disagrees with this reading or interpretation of Taylor Swift's work, which this writer is insisting is the only correct interpretation, as so many conspiracy theorists and 9-11 truthers do, anyone who delivers a criticism of this must be coming from the flow of compulsory heterosexuality and patriarchy. How sad for them that they can't deliver a valid critique because they are so blinded by the truth. A woman who loves women is most certainly a monster to a society that prizes male power. She can fulfill none of the functions that a traditional culture imagines. Wife, mother, maid, mistress, whore, so she has a few places so she has few places in the historical record. The sophic possibility of her work is ignored, censored, or lost to time. If there is queerness earnestly implied in Miss Swift's work, then it's no wonder that it, like that of so many other artists before her, is so often rendered invisible in the public imagination. Well, it's not invisible because you're the public imagination.
then you're imagining it. While Miss Swift's song, largely written from her own perspective, cannot always conform to the idea of a woman our culture expects her celebrity can, that separation between Swift the songwriter and the star allows Miss Swift to press against the golden bird cage in which she has found herself. She can write about women's complexity in her confessional songs, but if she ever chooses not to publicly comply with the dominant culture's fantasy, she will remain uncategorizable and therefore unsellable. So the idea here is that Taylor Swift would be completely unsuccessful if she were to come out, and this is yet another reason on the laundry list why she can't and is instead doing subliminal messaging. So sure, you can assume that she may suffer some reputational damage given that, you know, it is not 100% widely accepted to be gay in this day and age, but it's 2024 and she's already one of the biggest artists in the history of all time. It would take a lot to make Taylor Swift unsellable. Again, the drama, the drama of it all, the false problems being created the binaries that we tangle ourselves up in. Whether she is conscious of it or not, Miss Swift signals to queer people in the language we use to communicate with one another that she has some affinity for queer identity. There are some people who would say that through this sort of signaling, she has already come out at least to us, the crazy people. But what about coming out in a language the rest of the public will understand? So the conspiracy theorist, again, refuses to consider alternative explanations, rejecting all disconfirming evidence, such as Taylor Swift saying, I am not part of this community, and blatantly seeking only confirmatory evidence to support what they have decided to be the predetermined truth. She literally told on herself when she wrote about her descent into this nonsense at the beginning of the article. And here she implies that she knows the predetermined truth and that so do her fellow co-conspirators and any alternative alternative explanation is irrelevant because whether even Taylor Swift herself is conscious of what she is actually being accused of, it doesn't matter because the truth has already been decided with or without her participation. Therefore, any disconfirming evidence such as her blatantly saying on the record multiple times that she is not part of this community actually doesn't hinder the conspirators at all from continuing to indulge and spread their delusions. Blah, blah, blah. You know what this is? This is really Gaylor apologist behavior because this next segment of the article really tries to tie itself in knots to to justify outing Taylor Swift. If we take the supposition that she is in fact a gay person hiding in the closet, what the Gaylers do is still despicable and evil because they are trying to force someone to be honest about something they clearly are not ready to speak about if we are taking that supposition to be true, which I don't, but let's just play the thought experiment. American culture still expects that stars are cis and straight until they confess themselves guilty. So when our culture imagines the celebrities coming out, it expects an Ellen style announcement that will submerge the past life in Phoenix fire and rebirth the celebrity in a new image. In an ideal culture, wearing a bracelet that says proud, wearing a pride flag on stage, placing a rainbow in album artwork, or suggestively answering fan questions on Instagram would be enough, but our current reality expects a supernova. Again, you're writing yourself an excuse for demanding the public outing of a celebrity, and this is really despicable behavior to me. Because of this expectation, stars end up trapped behind glass, of course, which is reinforced by the tabloid press's subtle social control. That press shapes the public's expectations of others' identities, even when those identities are chasms away from reality. This is a word salad. This is some really horrible writing. <laughs> this is true. This is style over substance for real. Like there is nothing going on. The lights are on, but no one's home. Celebrities who master this press environment, Miss Swift included, can bolster their business, but in doing so, they reinforce a heteronormative culture that obsesses over pregnancy, women's bodies, and their relationships with men. So not only is Taylor a victim of this culture, as you say, but she's also a perpetrator of the harm that this culture causes by refusing to come out. Okay. All right, Grandma, we need to get you to bed. So then there's some more endless and pointless pontification about how we should be living as gay people in this world and what we should aspire to and how should we come out and how should we expect to interact with each other. Living in aspiration means ignoring the convention of coming out in favor of just existing. This is easier for those who can pass assist and straight if need be. Those who are so wealthy or white that the burden of hiding falls to others and those who live in accepting urban enclaves. This is a queer life without friction. Coming out in a way straight people can see is no longer a prerequisite for acceptance, fulfillment, and equality. Speculating at length in the New York Times and spreading false information and conspiracy theories about someone's sexuality is so far from living in aspiration. That is not an aspirational world of a gay experience that I, as a gay person, want to live in. A queer life without friction should mean that people do not take this much of a studied interest in other people's sexuality to be fulfilled and to feel accepted you cannot also feel harassed bullied and scared other celebrities who experienced behavior like this such as kit harrington louis tomlinson harry styles have spoken about how incredibly psychologically damaging this crusade to out them was lauren from fifth harmony felt that she was further boxed into the closet because of this and painted as a predatory lesbian trying to turn camila cabello into being interested in women and she described that, that was an incredibly 
painful experience for her and it did not lead her to any sort of self-acceptance and it did not lead the culture towards any wider acceptance either. That's what this kind of speculation does. It encourages a culture of fear and silence. It does not alleviate it. If coming out is supposed to be a radical act of resistance that seeks to change the way our society imagines people to be, then undeniable visibility is essential to make space for those without power. You cannot browbeat me into believing that trying to force someone who you believe is taking great pains to hide their sexuality into coming out is a good thing, actually, no matter how much money they have. It's an invasive, horrible thing to do, and it completely takes away someone's agency. We have no choice but to actively, vocally press against the world we're in until no one is stuck in it. Do you realize what she's saying here? She's saying we have no choice but to be gayler. We have no choice but to force Taylor Swift to admit that she's a lesbian, because if we don't, then we don't have the undeniable visibility essential to make space for those without power. I mean... It's delusional. It takes neither a genius nor a radical to see queerness implied by Miss Swift's work, but figuring out how to talk about it before the star labels herself is another matter. Right now, those who do so must inject our perceptions with caveats and doubt or pretend we cannot see a lie, implicitly acquiescing to convention's constraints in the name of solidarity. So what you're doing here is admitting that you have been hedging your bets, not because you are taking an objective approach to examining the phenomenon of Gaylor, but because you know that you don't have the facts to substantiate what you're talking about, and therefore you have to hedge your bets. You can't speak with certainty because you cannot prove that what you are saying is true. Part of this insistence that Taylor is gay or fruity and what's done frequently throughout this nonsense and drivel of an article is perpetuate harmful stereotypes about gay people and violate gay people's autonomy by dictating how they present themselves and reinforcing to straight people and the public in general that you can definitely surmise how someone spends their time in the bedroom simply by assessing the way that they look, act, or dress. Does that not seem reductive? This is a beyond regressive approach to mainstreaming queerness as this article so desperately pretends it wants to do. Any lofty or egalitarian goal that the Gaylers have is immediately negated by the fact that they dehumanize Taylor Swift at every opportunity they get and reduce sexuality to a bunch of aesthetic choices and the opinion of other people. Then there is a long diatribe basically about how Taylor Swift is lying. So first it's we love her so much because she's our gay queen. Then it's we hate her because she's lying to us. Then it's we have to out her because if we don't then all gay people will suffer. In every case, is the best form of solidarity still silence? You're literally splitting hairs about showing solidarity with someone who is trying to show solidarity with you because she's not part of your group. This is why you can't come to any conclusions in your article, Ms. Anna, because it all leads back to the nonsense. Every time an artist signals queerness and that transmission falls on deaf ears, that signal dies. And who made you the divine expert on who is signaling what and when? This is not the handmaid's tale. <laughs> People don't need to do covert signaling and avoid expressing who they are in the public domain, especially when you are a rich, white, wealthy woman. As you've just said moments ago, you talked about how easy it would be for Taylor to come out. You've talked about how it's her responsibility to do so. And yet you also say that basically we are living in the handmaid's tale where Taylor's risk of coming out is so large and so massive that she simply must signal her queerness with these transmissions that fall on deaf ears. Make up your mind, pick a struggle. So whatever you make of Taylor Swift's sexual orientation or gender identity, something that is knowable, perhaps only to her, the most galling part of this article is when the author suggests that we don't need Taylor Swift's input at all, actually, on what her sexuality is, that she might not even know it herself. And these delusional meth head, where were you on January 6th characters, somehow know better than Taylor Swift does herself what her sexuality is. This is beyond dehumanizing. It completely undermines her right to self-identify which she has tried to do politely countless times and she will continue to do and you will continue to ignore. Choosing to read closely can also train the mind to resist the image of an unmarried woman that compulsory heterosexuality expects. So what you're saying is in order to reject compulsory heterosexuality, you must gayler. Again, false premise. After all, would it truly be better to wait to talk about any of this for 50, 60, or 70 years until Miss Swift whispers her life story to a biographer? You know what? It's better to wait until the person you're haranguing says they want to talk instead of trying to force or speak for them. Well, I'm exhausted now and disappointed that this article was published in the New York Times, but I'll always be here to be your opposing counterforce. Leave me a comment down below. If you're a gayler, you'll get blocked. This is not a safe space for you. I don't know how many times I have to say it.